church was to create heaven on earth. There was a way that medieval religious ideas were fused with classical ideas, what we call Neoplatonism, that allowed the church to function as a set of symbols. So light was understood as being the least material of God's earthly creations, of the things we encounter. If we think about the moment of creation, it's the separation of light from darkness, and there was light. It's this originary moment. It's the thing that is the least material and the most transcendent. We talk about the metaphor of divine light, of the light of God, and this is a very pervasive metaphor throughout the Middle Ages. It is weightless, it can be beautiful, it is a perfect metaphor that can begin to allow one to conceptualize what the heavenly realm must be like. And so it really becomes a priority for the Gothic architects to allow as much light into the church as possible. One of the ways that that becomes possible is through the use of the flying buttress, where in the Romanesque church, a window was a hole, a space, surrounded by wall. What we get in the Gothic church is the supporting structure pulled out of the church through the flying buttress, which holds up the edifice, but allows for a complete opening up, or nearly complete opening up of the walls. One of the real problems was that while one could bring down the enormous weight of the stone vaults down on huge piers on the inside of the church, those piers would have to be so thick that they would actually become a kind of wall. And that's what we see in the Romanesque church. That's right, that's right. And of course the walls themselves were supporting, and so they couldn't be opened up. The windows were very, very small, and the emphasis was certainly not on those windows. Those churches tended to be quite dark. But there was another problem, which is that weight doesn't just bear straight down, it wants to move outward. So a flying buttress actually allowed for that splaying weight to be brought outward and then down. So what happens is the heavy ceiling of groin vaults exerts a thrust not only down, but also out. That's exactly right. And so the flying buttress takes that lateral outward thrust and moves it out of the church and allows for the opening up of the wall space in between the buttresses. If you look at the history of the flying buttress, they tend to be fairly substantial early on and they thin as the engineering is perfected because the flying buttress itself, which is a kind of thin or ribbing that exists outside, can actually block the sunlight against the stained glass windows. So the idea was to thin those as much as possible. All of this is in order to be able to open up those great stones walls and allow the light to pour in. All according to mathematical proportions. We know that the architect at Chartres used the golden section. He's thinking clearly not just about individual numbers but about the harmony between the parts and this harmony again is a reflection of the harmony of the cosmos as created by God. Now this is an ancient idea. You can go back to Pythagoras and ultimately this would be seen as Neoplatonic and so harmony and ratio and perfect proportion was a way of coming into contact with the ideal perfection of the heavenly realm of God's will. Chart is based, as so many Christian churches are, on a basilica plan, that ancient Roman public building. But Christian churches tended to make them into cruciforms, into the shape of a cross, by adding a transept that literally intersects the nave. And Chart is no exception. The Romanesque church that Chart was based on, however, didn't have a transept. And the transept was added when it was rebuilt after the fire, precisely to allow for greater crowds of people coming to visit the church, specifically to see the virgin's tunic. A pilgrim could come in and walk around the outside aisles, go all the way around the back of the choir and come out the front without ever having to cross in front of the altar. Or to enter or exit. What the transept did was provide an extra entrance for visitors to the church. I'm looking now across the transept through to the aisles, and what I see is the large rose window of the north transept, The lance sits below, but my eye moves around to the stained glass and the clear story, this feeling of being surrounded by colored light. You had mentioned that there are the five lancets and then that large rose in the north transept, but that wasn't enough. That window also has four descending lancet windows that fit into those negative spaces. Every inch that can be opened up is opened up. The North Rose window is related to the sculptural program outside. In the center of the rose is the Virgin Mary with her child. 
and she's surrounded by four doves just above her, four thrones and four angels. Outside of that, in the diamond shapes, are the kings of Judea, who were believed to have been her ancestors. And beyond that, 12 minor prophets. So the idea is that from the very beginning, this was God's plan for mankind, to save mankind through the prophets and the ancestors of Mary and Christ from the very beginning of creation. The church is still a vehicle for education. Let's walk under the rose window, go outside at the north end of the transept. We're looking at the north transept at Chart, and it protrudes pretty substantially from it's, the church. It's a deep porch or entranceway into the church, and you can imagine people gathering here. It's big enough that it almost seems like it could be a church itself. The outward most of the archivolts is linked directly to the archivolt that's just inside that. They show hand in hand God as creator and then that which he creates. God speaking the word and the word becoming material. At the lower left side, God gesticulating and then <laughs> just inside that, the waters and the earth and they're separate. So the first uh, page of Genesis enacted. And then God creates Adam and Eve, looking a little bit more thoughtful as he creates Adam and Eve, maybe even a little worried. I think, I think that's right. <laughs> this entire portal is devoted to the time before Christ. That's right, with a focus especially on Mary, who we see being crowned in heaven by Christ in the tympanum. If you start down at the trumo, that is the column that separates the two doors, you actually see her mother and Mary in her arms as a child. And then just above that, we've jumped to the end of her life, the Dormition, and then the ascension of Mary into heaven. And then she is being welcomed and blessed in heaven by her son Christ. Right, and on the jams, we see figures who look really different than the figures on the jams on the west facade. These are much later, there's our post fire, and these look much more typically gothic. There's a sense now of drapery that begins to have some volume to it, bodies that aren't quite as elongated, more in proportion, and most importantly, figures who seem to begin to relate to one another emotionally, as though there's a story happening here. They're not just transcending reality, they seem to be a little bit in reality. In acting compared to the totally transcendent figures in the West work. So these are are now 13th century figures as opposed to 12th century figures. Right, and so we have an order from left to right, Melchizedek, Abraham. And with Abraham, you can see the diminutive Isaac just in front of him. And Abraham perhaps looking up to the angel who's going to stop him from, from slaying his son. Right. We move on to Moses, Samuel, David. And then on the right side. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Simeon, and John the Baptist, and then St. Peter, who we can see holding the keys to the kingdom. Old Testament prophets, according to the Catholic tradition, foretold the coming of Christ. Right. Ending here with St. Peter, who's the founder, the rock. I'm looking up now at their faces, and they're so much more individualized than the faces that we saw on the West Portal, so much more emotional. And I'm looking especially at John the Baptist, who almost seems to plead with us as he looks down at us. 